when you have small teams, like the value of ML is you could start to like really scale things out because you start to use machines as like the assistant to you, right? So you train something manually and then you like send it out in the world and then it does that at scale for you, which is like a really, like it's like, it's like a superpower. And so I just started going farther and farther down the, down the path of saying, hey, like there's, we can make this team of four people, you know, behave like a team of 50 people if we start to use ML more and more. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Chris Alvin is the director of machine learning at the Wikimedia Foundation. And before that, he had a number of really interesting jobs, director of data science at Devoted Health, director of data science at Ushahidi, which was an open source nonprofit that did mapping and a project director at Frontline SMS. He's also a well-known educator on machine learning, the author of Machine Learning Flashcards, Machine Learning with Python Cookbook, and several fantastic machine learning tutorials. I'm super excited to talk to him today. Maybe we'll jump into, um, there's kind of a theme around, um, I guess, moderation and truth and security that I'm sure you you think about a lot. Um, and one question we, we got from Twitter was basically, someone was wondering if Wikipedia's experimented with like tools for moderators or kind of tools for educating disputes. I have to say, I've seen a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of fighting in the the comments <laughs> on Wikipedia pages and I'm, I'm kind of always impressed that they, they resolve, but are there, I guess, like special tools or algorithms that y'all use? No. And I mean, that's really, you know, sort of foundational to, to Wikipedia that it is at the end of the day, it is a human project of humans deciding, like trying to get the truth. What is the perspective? Like what's that neutral perspective between the parties? And I have said that after joining the foundation, the new thing that I do is I care less about the Wikipedia page. I really care about what's called the talk page. So every page on Wikipedia has like a separate comment page where people are constantly discussing like over and over again, discussing, debating, like finding new information, going back and forth. And so we've, you know, with things around disinformation, we've definitely been exploring areas of, uh, for example, sock puppet protection. So sock puppets, if you have like lots of accounts mm -hmm. um, and trying to build models that like help predict that around like dispute resolution, like at the end of the day, you know, if you see something on Wikipedia, we really want you to think, okay, cool. A human has like, at the end of the day, a human has decided this, a human has made this kind of decision. Mm -hmm. um, and so things like algorithmically sort of like making those decisions for, for, for people, that kind of stuff is an anathema to, to everything of, uh, which is why frankly, people love it so much. Right. And which is why doing machine learning in that environment is so interesting because you are trying to do things at scale with a human in the loop. You just have, thousands and thousands and thousands of humans who are willing to help you out. In the <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, and I guess another question along the same lines is um, someone was asking, you know, what are some of the most contentious Wikipedia articles and um, does your team ever get involved to, to kind of resolve edit wars in, in any way? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of contentious pages across, across many, many languages. Uh, the interesting thing that I, I think people don't realize a lot is that uh, I work for the Wikimedia Foundation. We are the nonprofit organization that helps sort of keep the infrastructure up. We fight legal battles for, for you know, different Wikipedia communities, but each individual language of Wikipedia manages their own show with their own rules based on a common set of norms across all Wikipedias, but it is like their own show. They're like Wikipedia, like English Wikipedia has an incredibly um, elaborate system of like dispute resolution, different levels of user access between the admins. Like there is a full volunteer organization in English Wikipedia that is managing those kind of things. And that's the mm -hmm. same with other languages. So for us at the foundation, it is very critical that we actually don't get involved and jump in because our role is sort of the, you know, the folks who are like one step back, we're like, we'll make the site better for you. We'll make things, your experience better. We'll recommend things that we think are interesting. We'll highlight, you know, we'll help you work faster as an editor using ML, but we're not going to jump in and say, Hey, you know, <laughs> Steve is right. And, you know, like Jason was wrong in this particular article. That is not, that is not our role um, of which I think if we played that role, we would be the most hated organization very quickly. <laughs> right, right, right. And I guess, you know, someone else was asking, you know, do you, do you is, is sort of the implications of ML um, kind of top of mind? Like I would imagine it's, you know, it's, it's hard to be like really neutral with any kind of tool, right? Like, do you, do you ever feel like 
there's sort of implications for how your your tooling works, even though you're really just supporting uh, moderators. I would imagine that, like for example, subtle changes in how search works yeah. might actually really change, you know, like what content people are seeing because there's such a high profile um, set of web pages. No, I think probably one of the key foundations of the team is the idea that any kind of ML that we do is not neutral at the end of the day. And so our gold standard when we are making models is that the model reflects the training data from the particular community that is served by that model. So for example, French, French Wikipedia wants a model that say predicts the article quality, like if this article is really good or bad to help editors decide which articles they should really jump in and help in. We mm -hmm. want to get that data from the French Wikipedia community, train it, train that model, and then serve it back to the French Wikipedia community and give that community the ability to actually manage and govern the use of that model in their system. And so what we're saying is like, hey, there is no neutrality here. This is, but we will try to limit our ability to like, say, train something on English Wikipedia and then apply it to, you know, say Vietnamese Wikipedia by gathering the training data from that original community and then serving back. It's not possible all the times um, because, you know, some models have to be like, you need to be global scalable. There isn't like enough training data and that kind of stuff. But that is our gold standard that we go for and that we've done many, many times over the years. Got it. And I guess one other kind of question on this theme of moderation that somebody asked that I'm kind of curious about is what's, um, What's the most common type of spam attack that you deal with? Or what are the sort of like adversarial problems that you you come across on, on your different properties? Yeah. Well, I mean, they they I mean the most common one is someone like putting in like poop or swear word like randomly into articles. Um, and so, you know, like detecting that through like the community's actually done a great job because I think people don't realize that English Wikipedia community and other Wikipedia communities actually have develop their own machine learning models like as bots that they deploy mm -hmm. by themselves with no need from the foundation. We host them, um, but it is like theirs to like do mm -hmm. whatever they want with. Uh, but the most common one is definitely like adding swear words <laughs> in something, or, you know, so as you as you can imagine. Um, you know, the ones that are are the most dangerous are definitely the ones that the attackers have a lot of resources. So one of the things that you quickly realize when you work here is that all of our models are open source. Everything we do is open source. You can see the whole thing. You can see my internal chat. You can see my ticketing system. Like my Jira is totally public. Like what I'm working on in a given day is public. I'm live streaming the work that I'm doing every single like other week or something like that. Like all this is open. And every single article on adversarial, you know, like not adversarial, like machine learning, but like adversarial attacks on machine learning systems is like, well, if you have the model or you could actually like use the prediction really, really quickly, you can start to figure out how to game the system because you have such exposure. We are exposing ourselves to that all the time by showing them exactly what's happening with the model, by giving them the training data. And, you know, that is that sort of give and take that you sit where, okay, how do we you know, work to sort of see how other people are behaving in the system in order to like detect any kind of problems while also making it that like we have a, you know, all of our models, you could hit an API for free and just use, use as much as you want. As long as you don't crash the system, like you're, you're good to go. And so people are using it tons of times. They can download the model, they can download the training data, they can run it locally, they can do whatever they want. Um, but of course there's risk in that, right? Because there's no, people can see your entire hand. It's like playing poker where like you're showing your whole hand and they're not showing any of their hand. <laughs> you're, you're definitely at a disadvantage, but it is, you know, it is a trust-based activity that people who spend hours and hours and hours, you know, making changes to the site, writing new articles, finding some new interesting fact, and then hunting down like where to put that in or sitting on those talk pages and debating and discussing like how to exactly like phrase a single sentence about some article because it's really important to get that right. That only works if they can come to see my team and say, hey, they're, they're doing everything. Like I can see what they're doing. I understand what they're doing. I understand like, you know, where they're coming from. Um, and I can participate in that. That's like the only way we have anything because the worst case scenario would be that people thought that what we were doing was like a black box that you just couldn't see. And there was some mystery behind what it was. And we were just like, no, just trust us, just trust us, you know, um, don't trust us, <laughs> come and look, come and see, run the code yourself, tell us we're wrong. Um, we're Wikipedia. So like, we'll definitely, uh, you know, invite changes <laughs> all the time. What does it, um, what does it feel like working 
with that level of transparency? Like, you know, besides, I mean, I can see how, you know, it, it really must keep you honest about around like, <laughs> you know, like security holes and, and um, thinking really carefully around, you know, like not, not doing security through obscurity, but like, what's the experience like? I mean, I assume that your previous roles, you didn't uh, live stream your work yeah. as, you, as you were doing it. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I've worked in the nonprofit space and the startup space uh, for a long time. And in both of those spaces that I've traditionally worked, even when we were doing open source work, it was sort of off in a corner, right? And like, there wasn't really that many people who were paying attention to it. Or if you're at a startup, it's literally all IP. And so you're like deep in the bowels of the organization in the back, working on some algorithm that people hope will like help them raise money or something like that. But no one's going to see it. No one, you know, you're never going to publish it. There's never going to be a paper about it. It is just, you know, your secret sauce in the rear. Mm -hmm. And so at, you know, at Wikipedia, because we do everything so open, I have learned to lean in on the idea of being open um, with a large amount of humility. So, so just to give a real example, um, uh, we are going to start releasing uh, model cards. So an individual like page that describes every single model that we host. And we've been looking, at, we've been sort of making prototypes and experimenting with them. And the experiments are public. You can take a look at the experiment page and sort of like see what's happening. But some of the models are going to look embarrassing. Like you're going to look and be like, wow, that's a, that's a really bad model. I can't believe you put that in production. And we just need to like, that is the only way to go in the scenario is to just say like, hey, we are, we are going to be open. We're not going to take offense to something that you say our model is, is like crappy. Like come help us fix it. Like we will lean into all the humility that we can because that is the only way to do this. The only way to do this is just to come in with a huge heaping pile of humility and openness and just let things go. It is, it is weird and it is different um, because when you work on the team, you work on this sort of nexus between machine learning, which a lot of people are interested in and Wikipedia, which a lot of people are interested in. And so like, there's, it's sort of like working under a spotlight in a sense. Mm -hmm. So like I, you know, I do live streams of, of myself working in the first few weeks, like a hundred people were showing up and they would just watch me like not know something, <laughs> like not understand how something's working, not understand how my system's working. Um, and then, you know, just, I mean, another example is I, there was, uh, there was this bug report that I randomly saw that showed that like a huge percentage of the traffic of one of our data centers was because of one image, like one image was all the data and it was some like flower or something like that. And I was just like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll tweet about it. And so I just, I like, I tweeted it. And then within 24 hours, it was like a hundred articles about this flower that was causing all these problems on Wikipedia. And then people kept on coming to the fabricator tickets, like the JIRA ticket that the engineers were working on to fix it. And it was like crashing fabricator because of so much traffic. And they were like sending in messages of support and all these comments and ideas of what they thought it was. And then all the engineers were like, just stop, just stop. We think we got it. Just like <laughs> stop posting comments. Um, but you are like, you're, you're in the open, you're in the mm -hmm. open, you're in the public and you cannot be defensive with how you do it. Because I mean, if you're really defensive about it, it's probably not a great job. <laughs> you probably, probably won't be that enjoyable. Do you think you've had to develop a thicker skin? Like I know whenever, you know, I do anything that's very public, you know, mostly the feedback is positive, but I really feel the negative feedback much more. And it, it, it I think it causes, you know, any kind of public thing we do to I feel like a little tinge of stress. Like I, I kind of can't imagine if everything was like public and visible <laughs> and people were watching it. Do you, has it kind of changed your, your mindset at all or the way you work? Oh yeah. I think when I started, I, I think I had a reasonably thick, I think I was fine. You know, I had a regular thickness of skin. <laughs> right. Put it. right. Um, and I was like, oh, I'll do fine in this role. What would you do possibly? And then you see what happens, right. Where like, People don't like what you're working on. You think people don't think the foundation should exist. People don't think there should be machine learning in it. People think your model's wrong or dumb or stupid, or why would you do it? Or like, there's this particular problem, or why aren't you working on this other thing? Or 10,000 things. And remember, everything we do is public. So like someone can post a comment about a ticket from like 2014 and say, oh, this is stupid or whatever. And people can like take your code and say, oh, you know, like you get that all the time. Um, it is something that I think everyone on the team just learns to be okay with. And I think the best people who do it are the people who just come in and 
as you know, as I was saying, just lean into the idea, like, Hey, it's okay. You know, like, like people like what we're doing, like, you know, to the most part, some people won't, that's okay, but there'll be people who just won't like it. Um, and that's, that's totally, that's, there's nothing to do about that. Right. There's no other way to way to operate, but yeah, there's definitely, um, you know, there's definitely times where you're like, Oh my God, this is, this is brutal. <laughs> this is, this person really doesn't like me. Um, but you know, I, I, all of that pales in comparison to like the simple fact that like I get up every single morning and people pay me money to work on Wikipedia and all the other projects. That's what I do all day. Like all I do is I sit down and I'm like, Oh, like this would be a cool thing to do here. We should work on this. Let's change this up. Like all that's all I do. Just make Wikipedia, make, like work on Wikidata, work on like Wiki Commons, like all the cool projects for all these people who volunteered, like, like volunteered thousands of hours to work on this stuff. And my salary is paid by donations. So like people are donating five, $10 to like make my salary, right? Like that is how I'm working on it. I, it's once you put that more into sort of perspective, you're able to take a lot of heat. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Do you find yourself getting distracted by the content? I mean, Wikipedia oh, yeah. I find so fascinating. I, I would think if I was like working directly on it. I actually remember my first job, I, I was writing a search engine. We were practicing on Wikipedia. And I remember I just like every time I was editing the, or like monitoring the search results, I just go down these rabbit holes on whatever topic it was pulling up. It is it is genuinely hard. And, and not, not just like the straight content, but all the layers underneath it. Because when you when you start to work on it, you realize like all these little decisions that were made around like, oh, how do we do licensing? Or like, what is the kind of ramifications of this? So for example, like we have uh, like Wikimedia Commons, which is like all the images that we have. And it's like, oh, there's faces in the images. Like, is that like, what's the, why, why, why are there faces? Like, why are faces allowed in these? Like, what's, what's the rabbit hole? And that's like been a huge multi-year discussion by these, you know, like these folks of what to do about that and if that's okay and that kind of stuff. And then you just look at the talk pages and you look at the discourse and there's just, there's so much, it is like a, you know, that classic iceberg diagram. There is so much that's all public, but just not that front page. So there'll be a page of like, you know, like Dalmatian puppies. And then there's like, just a huge, massive like discussion of licenses and like behind the scenes of like how to do certain things. And I, I have definitely become very distractible, you know, because like there's like research comes out about really interesting ideas and I'm sort of constantly being pinged by like, oh, there's this cool thing about how to auto translate stuff or there's this cool idea of like, you know, how do we detect these particular stuff? Like maybe you should work on this and like trying to keep the team sort of focused <laughs> on like pursuing just a few, just a few things to move forward is, is hard enough. But um, I definitely do like that I can have Wikipedia open on my browser window forever. And it's like technically working, even though I'm like randomly scrolling, you know, like Prussian military history or some like super duper duper random like topic. Um, and Do you like, have a favorite uh, Wikipedia page or topic that uh, I uh, could look at after this interview? <laughs> I, I do, I do. Um, Tell me. It, it is called perpetual stew. Perpetual stew is the idea of a bowl of stew that is never stopped cooking. So it is cooked forever. Um, and the idea is you're constantly adding to the pot and as you're taking out from the pot. Um, and it's such like a crazy concept when you think about it, that you just have this like, you know, hundred year old stew that you're doing. Um, yeah, it seems a little disgusting. I mean, is it I, good? See, this is why, and the, the photo is amazing because it has like a whole fish in the photo, which is like, someone just throw a whole fish. It's a weird, it's weird, but it is, um, it like, it is exp- that is not something that I would ever imagine, but yet yeah, it's it's a cool idea. But there's that, was, that was a great answer that you just had like instantly. We didn't we didn't because no, I spent all day <laughs> looking at Wikipedia. Literally every all my conversations about Wikipedia, like all the time. It's like the images of it, the like different parts of it. So yeah, I definitely uh, have a long um, a long list of ones that I I do I think are, are great. I do think you know some of the ones that I have really appreciated have been the ones that are sort of in the news. Like, I don't think I really appreciated how much work the volunteers do when something is like fast moving news. Like I remember during the uh, US presidential election and I was like going to the page and like, there's all these procedures in place. They like, like the volunteers all on their own. Like they, like, you know, they lock down the page through this process. They, oh, you know, these kind of edits go through. How do you make changes? How do we do the wording of this kind of stuff? And all that, that happens like in the moment, like live. Um, which is just so 
cool to watch. And now whenever there's some kind of event, I like immediately go to like the relevant Wikipedia page and like go to the talk page and watch people like hash it out to like figure out how to work, which is just so cool. That's awesome. Um, I mean, one of the, I think one of the things I was excited to talk to you about is actually the, the ML infrastructure at Wikipedia. Cause a lot of the real world people we talk to have to be a little bit, you know, cagey or vague <laughs> about exactly, you know, what the problems are with the infrastructure is, but you've been, you know, you're so open about this stuff that I think we can really get into the, the yeah. nitty gritty, no, but we, we are all open, but I guess before, before diving in, um, and this is actually a question that somebody asked, but uh, you know, I think it's a really good one to start with is, you know, what are the like important ML applications at Wikipedia? I mean, you mentioned some of them and you say some of them aren't even run by your team, but like, just like off the top of your head, like what are the things going on using ML? So we do um, a lot of models that help editors. That's sort of like probably our main body of work. So this would be things like, for example, predict if a particular edit is, a, we think it's a productive edit or not, or whether we think it's like a damaging edit or not. And the mm -hmm. idea is not to make changes to Wikipedia ourselves, but to flag it for editors in the UI, literally the UI changes that they can say, oh, okay, cool. Like I should go, you know, I should go deal with this because this, this edit is probably bad. So I can skip this particular edit and I can go to this other edit, sort of prioritize work. Mm -hmm. um, we also are working on some things that we call structured tasks. The idea is that there are many ways to participate in, in Wikipedia. And one of the hardest barriers is that you try to get your first edit in and it's like instantly rejected because it like, you know, fails some like, you know, long established rule about how things should go. And so one thing we've been doing with structured tasks is like, can we use ML to recommend edits that we think will like pass, right? So like, mm -hmm. sort of like an easy mode and th they might be something simple like grammar or they might be the, the one that we're working on right now is like a link. So like whether or not, is this word a link to another, like, is this word like a link to another article? Like, should that be true? And so we'll like highlight the word and then highlight the sort of um, like where we think the art it should be pointing to and then ask them like is this right or not and then if they say yeah it becomes an edit that gets just you know pushed to quote unquote production um but that's sort of like our our big focus is to make that editor and reader experience better uh using ml and you know there's other things that we do like we predict the topic of the article and we look at sock puppet stuff um but the the big one is trying to make editors experience better and, and do you build separate models for every language or is this kind of all baked together as like a, a single model? We traditionally do one model per language. Um, right now I'm, I'm looking at a kind of shift where we end up doing uh, one model per language for every single model that we can, but then doing a language agnostic model for everything else. So basically, you, I mean, you can imagine of the 300 languages that, that we would support, there would be a language agnostic model that would work for all of them, but not as good as a language specific model of where we can. Um, and it's, it's because gathering the training data from each individual community is really, is really time consuming. And so you can't do that, you know, 300 times with a, the, the, with a really small team. And so trying to like do that balance where we can do that global coverage, but believe that the gold standard should be an individual language um, base model. It doesn't happen for everything. So for example, when recommending whether a link is, um, or rather really recommending whether like a word is a link or not for like that link recommender, which I just described, like we don't need to have a language specific model for that. We can take advantage of that. But I have, I know one of the questions that someone asked on Twitter was like, what am I interested in NLP? And language agnostic models is the thing that I'm really interested in. Uh, because when you start to do one, model per language, you run into like a scalability problem pretty quick. Like how do you maintain um, with fresh training data, with monitoring, um, with all that stuff of like a huge breadth of languages well beyond the languages spoke on the team. And so like, how do you like maintain that? And so having some kind of idea of like, okay, cool, let's do like a mix where we'll have like some models that are just across all languages. And then, but our gold standard whenever we could is to make like one model per individual language. And what we want, right, is that the community governs the Wikimedia Foundation. Like they're the ones who select members to the board. And then like, you know, the board decides what like the priorities of the organization are and that sort of trickles down to me. For us, like 
we want communities to feel that they have the power to decide what they want to do with the model. So like if someone, if French Wikipedia is like, hey, we want a model that predicts, you know, the edit quality, great, we'll like help them and get, get training data and put that model out. If they then decide that they don't want that model anymore, we'll turn it off, right? Because the goal is that like they, you know, we're here to support them and like their stuff. They're the ones who are putting like the huge amount of like hours and effort and time unpaid to make this stuff. We're just trying to like make their, make their lives a little bit better. I would imagine you have probably more requests than you can really feel. Like, how do you prioritize all the requests that, that come in for, for different models and also improving existing models? Yeah, a lot of times what is really hard is distinguishing different types of requests. So um, one of the things that you that happens a lot is that volunteers have like really spiky participation. This is just sort of natural, right? Like they do a lot of work on something and then they get a new job. And so they kind of like disappear with six months. Then they like, <laughs> and then they come and like do a lot of participation again. Right. And that's exactly how volunteering works because you know, like you're, you're volunteering, you have other things, school starts, you have a new kid, you decide that you're bored of doing it. You take up another hobby and that kind of stuff. And so that kind of like really spiky participation means that you know when when i when i took over the team like we talked about it a lot and we decided that what we wanted to do is that if we ended up hosting anything on the foundation servers that we will own it so like if someone comes in and like really works like you know like with us and helps us build a model and that kind of stuff and then they you know they go off and do something else like we will continue to maintain that model in perpetuity and keep on like running with it and that means that you have to be selective of what you take because you can't take every single thing that people are asking for if you're going to own everything that <laughs> that that comes in and so there is a process of sort of deliberating like what that would be and whatnot and, you know, there's other ways that people can host models at the foundation. So like, um, if any, this is a technical podcast, people are probably familiar with AWS and EC2. Like we, we run our own EC2 instance essentially, um, which is, you know, what you call cloud services where like people can actually go and like host their own stuff. Um, so like if they wanted to host their own things on our servers, that's totally fine and they can do it through there. But when it comes to like my team, we know that we need to own something because part of our idea of what it would look like to do community-based like public ethical ml is is ownership of us saying like hey we screwed up that this model is bad we screwed up that this model is harmful and the only way we can do that is if we actually own the model we understand how it works and that kind of stuff and evaluating models that get submitted or requests for models and that kind of stuff is like a real a real challenge of which is like unique to the foundation in a weird way so I guess how many how many models are you owning, like are running in at, at any given time? So we have I think 120 models right now, um, and maybe like five that are currently being that are being built. Where we stopped building new models for quite a while over the last year because we're switching infrastructures for model deployment, um, which we could we could talk about. Um, yeah, but it was. About it. There, there was definitely this moment where we were like this the current infrastructure which has lasted us a really long time and you know is is sort of like what got ml at the wikimedia foundation off the ground is like not serving us anymore we need to go back and figure out what to do and because of the nuances of of the foundation the foundation is a strong believer of privacy and of open source which means we don't use cloud hosted services we are not on aws like except for like very very small things we're not on google cloud compute we are like on our own servers in our own data center or not our own data center but in our own racks in the data center and mm -hmm. so building out a new model deployment system was literally starting off with like what are the specs of the servers that you want, like how many sticks of RAM. Um, and, you know, just to show you like the level, like I had conversations about how the racking was going to go. Um, I, I, we bought a GPU to try to test if we could, you know, use it in our, in our server. And like, I got this photo from the, you know, the person in the data center, like the Wikimedia foundation employee in the data center. He's like, try, you get the photo. He's trying to install the GPU into the server blade and he can't, it doesn't fit. And he's like showing me in the photo that it doesn't fit. Like that's the level of, of that, like, like bare metal up, um, which as a technical challenge is really fun. Um, it is, it is, I've taken a lot of appreciation that the foundation actually like 
cares so much about privacy that it is like unwilling to give up anything. It is very, very thing. You know, it is, it is funny because there's a ton of SREs at the foundation. Like most of the like tech stuff is by SREs because you constantly need to have these people like maintaining the systems and building the systems at that low level. But um, yeah. So what, um, what, what are these models? Like a, a lot of the questions that we got were actually like, are, is, you know, is Wikimedia using deep learning? I guess I, I should just ask that, but, you know, I actually want to be even more specific of like, can you tell, describe like, you know, what, what, you know, what frameworks are you building these models in? What are, what are they like? Yeah. Uh, so right now we have a lot of models in scikit-learn. Um, that was sort of the initial set of models. These are the ones that are predicting uh, article quality and um, the quality of an edit or like the topic of that kind of stuff. Uh, we've started to move towards um, more deep learning based models, particularly around like computer vision and NLP, because there's just like big advantages to, you know, using that. Um, and so we, <laughs> there was, you know, right as I joined the foundation, um, they were setting up yeah, some GPUs in like, you know, cause we have to use our own stack. So like literally installing the GPUs in the machines and starting to work on them there. Um, but, you know, as we move forward, you know, I know we're using fast text for some model, which is that, that Facebook library. Um, for, for me, you know, as the person who's, who's sort of, you know, hurting the cats in this, in this instance, I have become very interested in simple models because the goal of what we do at the foundation is accessibility you should be able to understand what we're doing. Like not every single person, right? It's okay if like not everyone who doesn't, you know, work in ML understands what we're doing. But my goal is that if you see a model that we're using, here's the foundation's model for detecting whether or not, you know, like this piece of text is a link or something that you can go to an open source page on GitLab. You can see the code that's plainly documented. You can see the link to the data that you use to train it. You understand what's happening because it's not insanely, you know, like it isn't so insanely like complex that it's impossible to access. Um, and then you can fix it. Like you can make it better. You can throw in improvements. That's what I want. I want people to see what we're doing. And so I am less interested in the most technical like solution. I'm definitely more in the sort of practical, like what is the sort of lowest common bar that, that does it. That said, there's some things that are, you know, frankly, particularly with NLP that I feel are just really complex. And we were just talking this morning about um, some models using BERT to try to like basically replace some of the models that we're using scikit-learn models on to actually, actually use BERT to like throw in there to make it better. So there is value, there is value in complexity, but you know, it goes back to the idea that like, I don't, I don't want people to think that we have a secret sauce. I want people to think that we're like, you know, a, a, a set of like, you know, hopefully somewhat humble people <laughs> building out in the open um, and you can come and help us and participate and challenge us and, and ask those questions. And so the more accessible we use, the better. If we end up using like a proprietary system to make it that, I mean, that would never happen. But the reason that would never happen is you'd never be able to like trust us that it was true. It would just like work or not work and you'd have to believe it. We want you to go and, and take it. So we are moving into deep learning. Um, I actually have a big ask for GPUs of which it is really hard to buy GPUs in case anybody has ever been in that world. It's super hard to do that. Um, so we're sort of out there hunting around for GPUs that fit into our servers um, at this at this moment. Um, you mentioned an infrastructure change. Can can you talk about you know what was what prompted that? Like what was happening and and what infrastructure you moved to? So um, our system and how it's run since the beginning mm -hmm. was on what's called ORS, which is our homegrown model management system. So before there was any kind of, you know, before there was Kubeflow, MLflow, or before MLOps was a thing, there was people at the foundation that were building essentially those functionalities from scratch. And it is 18 servers split across two data centers, um, one in Virginia and one, in, one set in Virginia, one set in Texas. And it, there was, there was issues around, you know, one of the things that it does is it, it, it is for deploying a very certain type of model, like particularly edit quality ones and that kind of stuff. And it's really paired with the training system. So the training system and the deployment system are like very, very, very interconnected, which means that you couldn't add, say, 
um, a deep learning model in there because it wasn't part of the training system, which is also a homegrown system. The big one for me uh, as, as sort of the director of the project was that how, because it doesn't use serverless infrastructure, there is a hard memory requirement. So if your model is, I think the machines have 128 gigabytes of memory, each of them. And if your model is two gigabytes, you now only have 126 gigabytes of memory left. So there's like literally, no matter how much that model is used, it could be used you know, every single second, it could be used once a month. It is like a, like a finite amount of resource, which is very problematic for us because so many, as we were talking about, so many people come to us and are interested in deploying a model or interested in sort of how we do things, which means that we need to, in order to participate with those people at a real level, we need to not so much care if something is really used or not, right? If someone comes in and they say, hey, I have a great idea for this project and we work on it with them and we create a model and then we deploy it, we need to be fine with it being dormant for months. Um, and maybe it's only used once a year or maybe it's used all the time and that's okay. But that you, when you reach that finite level of like literally you're running out of RAM and every single time you need to like, you're like, it's, it's a zero sum game where you're using more and more of the physical RAM to hold the models in memory. Yeah, you know, it just got, it got too far. And um, what I think happened is that the, this was sort of a pioneer in the space of, of sort of ML ops. And now what has happened is there's so many great projects out there that are doing ML ops that there's like such a value to switching over. So we've moved to setting up what we call Liftwing, which is a Kubeflow instance on a new Kubernetes cluster that we do it. And Kubeflow is a open source project for ML ops on, on Kubeflow. And there's so many great advantages of that that we've been taking in. For example, like the custom libraries. So we had a researcher who used fast text and didn't tell us because like we just hadn't made that communication and it was fine, right? Like he gave us this thing. We we're like, we've never seen FastX before, but hey, we'll build the we'll build the server for it. Like we'll you know build the service for it and the thing and and it'll run. It means you could run deep learning models or TensorFlow, or PyTorch, or whatever you want to do in that system. Everything's a little nicely Dockerized. So like we've been Dockerizing our models that we have on ORs and just Dockering and then move the Docker file over to the new system. There is way more stored analytics around things are working. We want to pair it with a full training suite. So right now we're sort of focused on model deployment, but we want to get to the point where we're doing nightly retrainings. So that would mean that we could do things like shadow models. So a prediction comes in, we serve it to two versions of the model, sort of compare the stats of like how it's doing. Um, sort of an A-B test, except for one of the, one of the, I guess the A actually serves back a prediction to the user. <laughs> um, but just a, you know, a huge amount of taking advantage of that modern infrastructure. Um, and it wasn't because, you know, like when this was started at the foundation, there just wasn't this infrastructure and now there is. And so like taking a step back and, and building that out has been really fun. I will completely admit that it is somewhat terrifying to start at a job, look around and say, hey, I think we need to build the infrastructure from scratch, which becomes like a planning document, which becomes a budget line, which becomes like server specs, which becomes like a server box deployed to like a data center, like the plugged in, which becomes like hiring SREs, which becomes like slowly configuring the system, which becomes like running through a thousand problems. Um, but it was, I mean, right now, like, like, where are we right now in that system? Yes, no, two days ago, we got our hello world that we served a prediction uh, using the system, which was so cool to see after after all that all that work, um, but that's really the you know the the fun part about the foundation is that you're doing something out in the open and you're doing something like frankly from a technical perspective from bare metal like from bare metal all the way up that's how you're figuring it out. And sometimes you hate your life for it because you're like, you know what's easy? AWS. AWS is easy. Look at all these wonderful services of which they provide people. But at the same time, having the control to sort of own the system from scratch and know that you know people's privacy is protected, that we have control over everything where any of the data goes, any of that kind of stuff, which means that people can participate in the projects with, you know, with feeling safe that they're not going to be exposed because they edited an LGBTQ article or something like that. Like, you know, we have that ability, which is so nice and it feels so good to have that, but it is a, it is a going to be a long process of us getting from, you know, moving on, like we're going to build a second cluster, which we're going to be using mostly for training. So in our architecture, we're trying to split up uh, one Kubeflow instance 
for uh, model serving and sort of keep that with really good uptime um, and keep that really, really simple. And then we're having a second one, which has access to the data center, which is more like if it goes down for a day, that's fine, right? And so we could be a little bit more experimental. We can push it a little bit farther. We can give more people access to the system. So like they can come in and break it um, without any kind of interruption to, to service and then move the models between the two um, as needed. And so what's the, what's the piece that Kubeflow is doing for you? It's, it's the swapping in and out of the models. Is that like the key thing that, that's the, happening there? The big part is the resource management. And I think that's always been the, the real value in that you, for us, our model usage is really spiky mm -hmm. because no one sort of, there's sort of like always a hum, like a certain amount of noise of people using the models. And then there'll be someone who wants to know a prediction of every single article on Swahili Wikipedia. And so you get this huge spike and we, uh, we try very, very hard to not limit people. Like when we, when we're limiting people's API access, it's because you're going to break the system. <laughs> if you do more, that is really our goal. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're funded by people. So like people should be able to use it. And along those lines, like having, being able to maintain that really spiky structure, particularly with models over like a broad range of systems. So like maybe one requires a GPU that uses TensorFlow, maybe two don't require one that uses, you know, like scikit-learn and then sort of managing all those resources um, in an automated fashion is super powerful for us because it, it means that we can not have what we have currently with ORS, which doesn't do that so well around like, you know, like I think, a year ago, I like I had my kid on my lap and I was manually restarting the prod server <laughs> using a using a script I'd written, like, you know, after a glass of wine to try to like get the surfer back up. Um, try to like get around those kind of issues with with something that balances those resources really well. I think there's other things that we care about at the foundation, like because it's an open source project, the foundation believes in open source projects. So we're like, we want to contribute back to them. I think there's lots of nice. Uh, on the training side, I'm pretty excited about some of the UI uh, UI parts of it. So for example, like Jupyter Notebooks that could connect, like would allow our researchers to actually connect to the database and actually train, like construct models in the Jupyter Notebook and then push a button to put it in production. Those are some of the things I'm, I'm interested down the road, but just straight resource management <laughs> is a big deal because, you know, the, it's, it's weird because the the thing about the foundation is the foundation is 500 people, which you're like, wow, that's a lot of people, but you're running like one of the top 10 websites in the world. The scale is crazy. And so yeah. trying to like do that with like, with what ends up being a small team when you sort of cut people down, you know, like down to, okay, people who are working on the tech department, people who are working on ML, people who are working on this particular system. It gets like very small number of people have a lot of uh, responsibility for things. And so automating what you can out to these systems is pretty nice and leaning on open source projects that like other people can help you with issues. Uh, is definitely true. Makes sense. I, I guess there's like another theme of questions. I want to make sure that we cover here just in our, in our crowdsourcing of um, questions for you, which I'd sort of summarize as, as sort of like, um, I think people admire the career that you've had and working on really impactful stuff in um, machine learning. I guess, how did you get into machine learning and how have you thought about your career? Like, how, how do you feel like you've managed to get to all these um, super interesting projects? Uh, so my formal training is in quantitative research, so actually quantitative social science research. So that was, I went to a PhD program that was all about stats basically. And when I was graduating, uh, I knew some people who were working on a Kenyan nonprofit and I just joined them, you know, and kind of was working on that. And then from there, you sort of grow a community of people and a social network that you know, and people keep on pulling you into other things to work on. Um, I, I think, you know, for me, ML, where the appeal was, was, you know, and I'm going to anger some statisticians on here. So, you know, this is hot take, hot take. Nice, great um, descent. Yeah. <laughs> That I, yeah, the thing that frustrated me about, about statistics is I tended to not care about the causal inference about a lot of things. Like I cared about like the results that was happening because I was doing a lot of this stuff, 
you know, in, in as a job and like impact. So I was doing like election monitoring. So it's like helping someone set up a SMS spatial election monitoring. Care. I didn't so much care about the causal relationship between like whether or not someone would send a, a message in or not. Like I cared if they did or not, right? Like I like a really, really focused on outcomes. Mm -hmm. And when you have small teams, like the value of ML is you could start to like really scale things out because you start to use machines as like the assistant to you, right? So you train something manually and then you like send it out in the world and then it does that at scale for you, which is like a really, like it's like, it's like a superpower. And so I just started going farther and farther down the, down the path of, saying, hey, like there's, we can make this team of four people, you know, behave like a team of 50 people if we start to use ML more and more and, you know, keep keep walking down that and just get more and more complex. And then as I started doing things at more scale, you sort of move from the modeling side to the sort of engineering side of like, okay, now we need to like, you know, now we have 200 models. Well, how do we like make sure every single model is running at all times and it's totally okay. And like, how do we do that at scale? And so you sort of like constantly moving to like the next more technical challenge in those range. But it is, you know, for me, I've, I feel like I have stumbled into this stuff, but really it was probably because when I got started, I, I, knew some people who are working at this like teeny little tech nonprofit in Kenya and just like got to know them. And then like, then they were sort of like, Oh, what about this other place? And then I switched places and then like, Hey, what about this other thing? And I joined that. And then it was like, you, know, you just sort of go from one thing to another, to another, to another. Um, and I mean, it's true that, you know, some of the people that I worked with 10 years ago on like various projects around, you know, like environmental projects and that kind of stuff, like work at Wikipedia, right? Like there's like work at Wikimedia, like they're still here. Like there's there's this there's this like you know group of people who are working on stuff. And it doesn't mean that other people don't come in, and it doesn't mean that it's not a job, right? Like it is a job that I go to every day, and I I do my job. But it is um, you start to see the same faces over and over again as you do this for <laughs> a while, and people invite you to come and you know apply for a role or or that kind of stuff. And how does it relate to your well-known uh, ML flashcards and, and <laughs> tutorials? Like what, what prompted you to do that? Do you think yeah. it's similar to your focus on, on maybe outcomes and applications versus the underlying statistics? Yeah, no, completely. I, so I, I think, you know, when people will, so I make these flashcards, like they're hand-drawn, they're all about ML concepts and people have come to me over the years and been like, Hey, this is like, you know, you should really read uh, read more books about ML rather than like flashcards. And I was like, well, one, I've read a lot of books about ML at this point. Um, but the point of the flashcards and the point has always been one single thing that ML interviews require a certain amount of rote memorization, right? There are people that try to throw you gotcha questions and I have received those questions and, you know, like describe a random forest, like from scratch and that kind of stuff. And those, you know, those questions, it is just easier to just memorize them, right? To just sit down and memorize it. And interviews shouldn't be run that way. I totally understand that. You know, we should all get to a better place where like that's not happening, but yet it does happen in most job interviews. And so for me, I just started making flashcards for it. Like, what is this concept? What is this concept? What is this concept, right? Like, can I do it? And just looking at the flashcards over and over again. And from there, I just sort of developed more and more of them. Um, and then, you know, other people got interested in that, in that kind of stuff, but it is, it is about, you know, getting that stuff into your brain. That's just, you know, it's not something that it's not something that you can read. You know, if you read a thousand books, maybe you probably forget the concepts because there'd just be so many. Instead, these are the concepts that I've run into at interviews and other people have run into the interviews and like, memorize it, memorize it, and then, then regurgitate it back up. Cause you'll look really cool when you write a, you know, write an equation from scratch or something like that, because you had it in your brain. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it goes back to the idea that like, I am interested in impact. I'm a thousand percent interested in impact. And like a game is being played in an interview where they try to stump you with like, you know, describe, you know, gradient descent to me. That's a game. They're trying to throw a trick question at you, crush it, right? Memorize the concept and then crush it in the interview. That that's it. And um, I, I wish people didn't throw those kind of questions, but they do. And so great. I will make flashcards to like get past that part. Um, it's less an issue now because I do more like management stuff. <laughs> so so the questions are uh, you know, not not so not so deep. 
but it's definitely was like a big part of my career it was like, especially for me, because people look at me with like a social science background, like literally my PhD is in political science. People are like, oh, so you're like, you know, a terrible coder and a non-technical person. So like, I'm going to throw you some gotchas in there um, and just being able to memorize it and, and you know, spit it out um, has been frankly, a really useful tool. <laughs> so when you, when you interview like a technical person, now that you're a manager, how, how do you approach that? How do you, how do you avoid gotcha questions? Like what, what questions do you ask to sort of get at the competence of somebody's work? Yeah, I actually really prefer to give people a choice of what they talk about. Um, and so like some of the questions that I've really liked have been like, you know, tell me about like, just what algorithm can you actually describe in detail? Like, you know, what's that, whatever, whatever you want. You Like, what's that one that you like? Um, what's that one that you have this your go-to? I like that because I'm not trying to say, hey, in my experience, this algorithm is important. And therefore, if you don't know that particular one, you're, you know, not qualified. And so instead saying like, hey, like, go, like, I want you to go deep, but pick, you can pick anything that you get to go deep in and let's just jam out about it. And I have really, really, really appreciated that because I have, I have had candidates who come in who have been, um, have been like pretty, pretty nervous and, you know, it can come off that like, they don't know what they're talking about or something like that. And I'll throw that question to them and they will just destroy it. Like they will just go so incredibly deep and they'll start to geek out on it and they'll start to enjoy the, the whole interview process because they get to talk about what they know and they light up about it. And it is so fun to participate in that. And it shows you that like, you know, it shows you that people have these like very variety of expertises, like, cause they did this particular ML model for four years and they really, really, really know it. And so you can say like, okay, you know, like that's cool. Like they'd be fun to work with that person. That's, that's the kind of stuff that I have grown to like because the fundamental truth about data science is that it's such a broad field that your questions that you get in an individual interview can be all over the place from like deep statistics. Like I've had to write a statistical proof at one point to like model production stuff. So like MLE, like, you know, engine ML ops kind of things. Like how would you architect a system to do this to computer science stuff, to social science stuff, just all over the place. And frankly, I'm amazed that anybody passes <laughs> these interviews. So I, I sort of liked giving people the opportunity to dive into wherever they, wherever they want. Um, if they can't find a place that they really dive into, that's also a signal, right? That makes sense. Well, you know, we're almost out of time and we have two questions that we, we like to end with, um, but I think you'll be, I think you'll have interesting responses. So I guess the second to last question um, is what's, what's an underrated aspect of machine learning that you think people should pay more attention to? Oh, wow. Wow. I, that's an interesting approach. I think the one that, that I really have started to like a lot is uh, low power models. So models that don't require, so there's one direction that ML is taking, which is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger models. And it's sort of like getting a bigger and bigger, bigger truck, right? You're just like, like, oh, you know, what would be better? Two engines. You know what's better than two engines? Six engines. You know what's better? Like 24 engines. And I have really started to like uh, teeny ML, like very, very, very small ML that you can run on a Raspberry Pi and that kind of stuff. And I, I think there's like a, there's a, there's a pureness around it, but there's also like creativity comes from constraints. And so constraining yourself to like very, very low resource settings is really interesting. And I think it opens up stuff around uh, with cheaper smartphones and that kind of stuff, which, you know, it's just a different direction than you're going to get from some of the, you know, really cool, but like huge models that take $24 million to train or something like that. Totally. Yeah. And even a Raspberry Pi is kind of big. I mean, <laughs> I know, so. Arduino. <laughs> 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 all right. And, and then the final question is, um, uh, what's the, what's the biggest challenge of making these models actually run in the real world? I mean, you're, you're actually responsible for running models. What's, what's, <laughs> what's yeah. your biggest challenge? The biggest one I think that I face is, um, well, I'll, I'll take a step back. When, when, when sort of me and you were getting into ML, because we're both, you know, slightly older, I don't want to claim that you're old, but you know, you're, you're around my age. Um, ML was just starting off. And so you could totally join an organization and make any model and run it on your laptop 
and it was better than the hard coded thing that you were using and you were like, you know, amazing, right? And so, that's no longer the case. Now it's the case that they've had, you know, 10 years worth of models that they've made all in these different settings, all in these different contexts. And they're retraining models every single night. And so they have like thousands or tens of thousands of models to deal with. Mm -hmm. And a big part of, of what I found is hard is like, how do you just manage all those models? And this is like, you know, a real pitch for ML ops. Like it is hard to manage just all those models all the time and make sure they're all like not broken, not old data, they throw errors, there's dependency management around it. Like, it is difficult to have in the real world setting, hundreds of models going out all the time, um, whether you're at a company or whether you're at, you know, at the Wikimedia Foundation, like it is just hard to do that. And it is not a surprise to me that ML ops has become, you know, like the thing that is really, really helping people in this field out because it is something that is otherwise just difficult. Like, it, like it's, it's insurmountable to think to, to do it yourself because there's just, it's easy when you have one model, right? And you can be like, oh, let me think about, you know, this particular hyperparameter deeply after reading a book. It's another where it's like, we're going to be training 6,000 models tonight. Like, how do you keep them organized? How do you keep them up? How do you like see how they're being used? How do you, you know, maintain them? Um, that is a different game, which is, you know, where we're going for sure. Awesome. Thanks so much. Great to end on. Yeah. Appreciate it, Chris. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out. 